Welcome to Slash Forward. In celebration of a rare Friday Christmas, we're going to party hard and take a deep dive into the recent Christmas horror classic, Krampus. If you're looking to regain your joyful inner spark, subscribe to the channel. Let's get to it. We open on warm and familiar scenes of Christmas bliss. Hordes of angry mouth breathers trample retail workers, desperately grabbing at the first Cabbage Patch Kid they can find. And as we take in the beautiful pandemonium, we watch individuals get and give their just desserts. It's amid the bedlam that we find our protagonist family, enjoying the annual tradition of the Nativity Brawl. In calmer environs, we find a badass traditional bake fest going down, because Omi is a classic bitch. As the family erupts back into the house, we learn the fight was instigated when Max heard that brutish fellow ruin the Santa myth for some young lad. Tom then turns on some holiday politics before going to take a few calls. As the rest of the family also files out to engage in selfish interests, Max is left with Omi to share a little Christmas whimsy on their own. Best Beth then complains to her mom about the upcoming family sleeping arrangements, but is told to suck it up by Sarah, who finishes hanging the newest family portrait and is displeased to find it contains a historical record of pervy Santa doing what he do. Back to those with true spirit, Omi relays her thoughts on the true nature of Santa, believing that he inhabits the spirit of the holiday, reflected by our true souls, a thought that causes her to momentarily go dead behind the eyes. Upstairs, still dreading the impending arrival of her Hilljack cousins, Beth is hard wishing she could be ripping that holiday bong with her boo, Derek. But they have to put that thought on hold when the house begins to rumble from the old diesel rolling up, announcing the arrival of the extended family. As all the last minute preparations are made, Merry Christmas! They're welcomed in bearing gifts and a thousand yard stare. Max attempts to initiate cordial conversation with his cousin, Howie, about his deepest holiday fantasies, but he's pretty much an empty vessel. And then Aunt Dorothy surprises them with her arrival, a last minute addition that Linda felt obliged to honor, despite knowing that her sister Sarah would be upset by this development. Soon enough, they've all settled into the dinner table, where Howie is doing the do, preparing for his football future. Here they suffer through a culture clash as Sarah is inundated with multiple complaints about her champagne tastes and the general lack of moistness present in their quails. So she heads off to clear her head and glaze a creme brulee while the girls test Max's patience by telling lies about Santa crashing his sleigh and being forced to eat his reindeer to survive. And then, in a demonstration of next level familial bullying, the girls whip out Max's special letter to Santa. They read it off and find it to contain some fairly deep and intimate wishes for the whole family, which lays bare some of their unspoken insecurities. Even though the dance damage is done, you know Max is prone to pop off, and he uncoils like a loaded spring, resulting in a scuffle, some shouting, and then him storming off. Tom tries to smooth things over with the boy, but he has trouble coming up with good reasons to spend such precious time with people you hate. He does manage to stir up some syrupy emotional garbage that sounds kind of okay, but isn't enough to placate Max, because as soon as he leaves, Max gives in to his darker nature, shredding the letter and sending it into the frosty night air, inadvertently conjuring some dark holiday magic. The next day, we see the family hunkered down in an unexpected blizzard, with no power or hot water. Max makes note of an apparently immaculately conceived snowman in the yard, and then they remarkably get a package delivered. While signing for it, they find some additional leavings on the front porch that are brought into the house. As they consider what to do next, Beth starts spazzing out about not being able to reach Derek, so she's given one hour to go check in on him and see if anyone else on the street has power. They're mostly not coping well, other than Omi, who is perfectly comfortable living in the old style, pulling a kettle hot chocolate from the fireplace like a truly classic bitch. Beth makes her way down the road, appreciating the picturesque quality of her surroundings, and then notices what appears to be a large roof-hopping figure. She takes off running, and upon finding the interior of the delivery van unsafe, she hides out underneath it instead. She then does her best to hold in her mouth farts while this cloven-hoofed bastard lumbers around a bit before taking back to the skies. He left behind an old-school jack-in-the-box that operates in a bit of a slow-burn fashion, and her fate is left to our imaginations. Back at home, Max is keeping a close eye on the mysteriously multiplying snow goons, while Tom and Sarah stare out the front window in worry. Deciding that Beth has been gone for too long, they enlist the help of Howard and his SUV to ford the snow and try to find her. But Omi doesn't want Tom to leave, as it's not safe. This is, of course, a clear indicator that she cares for her son, but not his heathen offspring. Regardless, they venture into the snowy darkness, eventually coming across an abandoned snowplow. Its story unfolds for them as they recognize that it appears to have been left abruptly, any personal belongings, but the hole in the windscreen appears to be pushed inward rather than outward, so the boys dip into Howard's gun cache before venturing further. 
serve. Back at the house, the sisters find a quiet moment to reconnect over the nostalgia of all the old ornaments and trinkets that Sarah saved all these years, thinking it would be what mom wanted. But then they're all distracted by the sound of pitter-pattering footsteps on the roof. Omi keeps relaxed as she studiously tends to the fire. Meanwhile, the boys get to Derek's house, which is empty, and appears to have been overtaken by the blizzard. They find evidence that disturbing events unfolded at the house, but with no indication of whether Beth was involved. Judging by the fireplace, Howard suspects a gas line rupture, but this doesn't explain the hoof prints nearby, which, to me, look kind of like they were made by a large goat. What kind of goat walks on its hind? Okay, fine. They're then drawn back outside by some vigorous screaming that's hard to pinpoint as it's carried away on the wind. But along the way, Howard is dragged into the snow by an unseen creature, requiring Tom to pull out. This drives off what I assume to be a snow worm, and they hobble back only to find Lucinda in utter ruin. The gunfire was heard at the house, but any ideas of going to find them are resolved when they burst back in, shouting warnings and looking to administer medical treatment. In a moment of clarity, they calm themselves and try to get the kids and the elderly into the kitchen so they can have a discussion about the events that transpired. Omi goes, but with one request. Kümmert euch um das Feuer. So while Dorothy and the kids tank up, the adults consult and discuss their options. With few positive outcomes on the horizon, Tom recommends they board up the house and hunker down until the weather breaks. Soon they're all locked up and cozy, and they find their bonds strengthened over the various acts of bravery exhibited that day. As repayment for his life, Howard volunteers to take the first shift of the Night Watch, which quickly transitions to total darkness as he promptly falls asleep with the rest of them, and the fire is allowed to die. Very shortly after, a strange sound begins to emanate from the fireplace, and we see a tasty treat lowered down. Young Howie is easily drawn in by the chain-born cookie, which lets him take a little nibble off the top before revealing its sentience and wrapping him in the chain to be dragged up the chimney. At the sound of the disturbance, the rest of them wake up and form a sort of human chain of retrieval. However, despite their best efforts, he's eventually wrenched from their grip and dragged off. Since nothing staves off the pain of a lost child like a story, Omi gets the fire started back up as she confirms they've all brought this upon themselves. And then she recounts the legend of Krampus. She grew up in a village that turned their back on the spirit of Christmas, everyone refusing to think of the well-being of others and otherwise acting in a general shitty manner. When their behavior finally pushed her to give in to the darkness, she capped it off by wishing the other villagers would just go away. So that year, they got the shadow of Saint Nick, Krampus, who comes to take and punish rather than to give and reward. She ended up losing everyone to the underworld, but was left behind as a reminder of the consequence of lost hope. Thankfully, she's sharing this after only losing two of the older kids and not any of the important ones. But Christmas spirit be damned, Howard is a man of action, and he aggressively heads out into the raging cold to look for Howie. But after a brief glance around, thinks better of it, and they instead focus on keeping that fire hot. Tom can't help but to think of possible pathways out of this, so he gathers the others to discuss a plan. He wants to try to get to the still intact snowplow and clear a path the others can follow in the cars with the kids. From there, they'll fall back to various pre-designated emergency locations until they find an active one that's populated. While this briefing is underway, we see the doorstep gifts are reaching maturation, and Max catches a glimpse of Krampus outside. Everything then gets put on hold as the girls venture upstairs to find a functional crapper and are drawn into the attic by the sound of someone whispering their names. Their screams attract the attention of the other residents, who proceed slowly, scanning the darkness with their flashlights, and eventually discovering, to their horror, that the gifts have hatched. What this means is not immediately known, but they soon discover that the jack-in-the-box has undergone super-puberty and is just finishing up his meal of fine children, opening his throat and knocking back Jordan like a shot before scurrying off. They're then descended upon by a tree-topping angel of death and a rabid teddy bear. When Tom tries to administer some assistance, he gets jabbed in the back repeatedly by a satanic Voltron. Then Linda catches sight of Stevie and gets down to business, stabbing her scare bear in the eye and cutting through the other obstacles on her way to the snake, which escapes into the air ducts, leaving her thankful that she had the foresight to bear so many children. While this is going on, Howard is downstairs investigating a noise in the kitchen. He takes a surprise kneel to the calf and discovers a gang of gingerbread men up to no good. He takes a defensive position and fires on them, crisping them up a bit, and is very nearly shanked in the neck before Rosie hops in and does the one thing she's good at. They then have only a moment to relax and regroup, before trying to locate the monster, now stuck in the HVAC. Thinking quickly, Max sends in Rosie to get at it, and they hear sounds of a struggle and then the creatures spill to the floor below. Here, Aunt Dorothy decides to test her metal and takes care of business. Unfortunately, this leaves her holding the gun when the elves arrive, so they hold the others at bay as Dorothy is chained up and dragged away, along with the baby, which also prompts Howard to rodeo ride that giant snaky bastard into the unknown. Those who remain find themselves at the mercy 
of the elves, but then the call of Krampus rings out, drawing them off. With all defenses now compromised, Tom insists that they make a break for the plow. As they take off into the blizzard, Omi makes her final stand, buying some time for them by facing down her consequence. Krampus works his fat ass down the chimney, and then the two of them have a warm reunion, in which he gifts her some age-inappropriate toys. Outside, the plow is within sight, and Tom encourages them on so he can hang back to hold off whatever is chasing them. He ultimately ends up freely sacrificing his body to the cause, which changes very little about the outcome, as Linda is quickly taken and followed shortly by Sarah. Now it's just Max and Stevie left to drive a complex piece of machinery in the middle of a blizzard. Plus, there are elves here. In the end, only Max is left to answer for his loss of faith. But in the interest of leaving a reminder of the consequence of losing your spirit, Krampus gifts him his ripped up letter and a little holiday trinket that maybe he'll be able to share with his future foster family. While this would make for a properly depressing ending, it's not quite enough for Max. He trudges to their encampment where the Hellspawn are enjoying the merriment of the holidays. He returns his gift and tries to unwish the disappearance of his family in exchange. But this just opens a cavern straight to hell. Max runs up to the lip to face down Krampus and makes the ultimate sacrifice, embodying the full Christmas spirit by offering himself in exchange for the safe return of his family. But he's already summoned the demon, who is unsympathetic. <laughs> and opts to take Max up on the first part of his bargain only, casting his body into the portal to hell. Then Max wakes up to a new day, a world with lights and no strange snowmen, and everyone enjoying their normal Christmas rituals. He chalks his experiences up to a bad dream, and delights in the joy of kith and kin receiving exactly what they most deeply desired for Christmas. But then he opens his own gift to reveal a familiar artifact, the presentation of which causes all of the bad memories to rush back into their minds. They all process this renewed trauma as we pan out to see they're stuck inside an internal Christmas snow globe on Krampus's curio shelf. Which honestly doesn't sound worse than burning forever. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. I'd like to take a moment to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. It's hard to declare a movie so recent as being a classic, and I know there are other good Christmas horror movies out there, but are there any better Christmas horror movies? For a small sampling, check out my holiday horror playlist, which contains all the other Christmas horror I've done so far. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.